All right, football fans, uh, listen up. Uh, this is our time to get educated each and every week. We got uh, Justin DeTavio on the line from Ironman Football. You can also catch his work at uh, State of the U. Justin, how's the summer treating you? Good, good. We're getting ready to go to team camp, which is always an interesting experience. Good stuff. So you brought up a subject a couple minutes ago before we started to record. Uh, the UConn football program has been down in the dumps, and especially offensively. And this is a program that about uh, 10 years ago, was in really good shape with uh, Randy Edsel as head coach. They uh, lifted themselves and uh, out of uh, the Division II ranks or whatever it was called at the time. And uh, I didn't think that they'd be able to compete uh, based on a number of factors, and they did. They were really good in the Big East. They won the Big East one year and went to the Fiesta Bowl, and they consistently went to bowl games and won seven or eight games for a period of five or six years. And then it all went south. Edsel left uh, after the Fiesta Bowl appearance. It went south from there. He's come back, uh, and it's been a disaster. Like, they last year were losing games at a historic measure by some measurements, uh, both offensively being anemic and just getting blown out by 30 and 35 points every week. And uh, you've looked at uh, what uh, could be the, the saving grace out there offensively to lift up this program and at least make it uh, somewhat watchable. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the answer uh, sounds a little more simple than it probably is, but I think more bad football programs at the FBS level should probably focus on being a flex bone team. Um, it gives you the added advantage, um, obviously, schematically, the way that Navy, you know, for a few years has, has managed to beat Notre Dame. That should never happen, you know, when you're looking at athlete for athlete, dollar for dollar, right, and facilities and everything else. That should be almost impossible. And then, uh, you know, you're looking at the rise of Army right now. They went back to a more option-based approach. Um, and obviously, Georgia Tech was, was successful at times in the ACC running the same offense. So when I start to think about it, I look at some of the more struggling programs. I feel like there's a few tiers uh, of program out there that could, that could use that, I guess, in a, in a couple of different segments, if you will. Yeah, so when I think of you and the discussions we've had, uh, you're entrenched in the passing game. You've uh, gained a lot of influence in uh, the passing game, and therefore I'm a little bit surprised by by your suggestion, although it does make sense in regards to any time, regardless of the sport, and especially football and basketball, when you have a talent disadvantage, you try to squeeze the game. Uh, you squeeze the clock, less number of reps on the field, less times to be exposed, less number of times for the superior athlete to take over, and you try to take advantage. And obviously, if you throw the ball, it stops the clock, number of reps, more things have to happen correctly uh, in each and every play. And then when you run that type of offense, and we've seen it, like you mentioned, with Army, Navy, and Air Force being very competitive when they shouldn't because they don't put the resources into football, uh, just that discipline of being able to execute the same thing and then throwing that change up at the opponent that they don't see the rest of the season seems to make sense. Yeah, it becomes very difficult to game plan for, um, you know, and, and when you're looking at it from that aspect, um, you know, you're having to, to find scout guys that normally could be a guy who might play quarterback for you one day or it might be just a, a, a little bit different. Uh, you'll have the same skill set in a way, but he won't be as talented as your starter. Now you're having to take some slot receiver off the scout team and move him to quarterback because he was a triple option quarterback at high school. If things are just having to move around completely, how do you really practice for getting cut over and over and over again? Well, you probably don't. And, you know, you may or may not want to practice having guys get cut, but they have to get used to it somehow because they're going to get cut over and over again. Those are long drives or 10, 12, 15 play drives. And then on the, you know, so you're having that to, to find your, your scout guys are having to, to try practice something new you're having to look at something new. A lot of times they run a 34 defense, you know, at Navy for a lot of the same reasons. You're, you're having not as many big guys, um, the one or two that you can find. You can really bank on the starters. And then you're having a lot of guys who can run around at outside linebacker, kind of that tweener position stuff. So I, I think that while it works schematically because people are having a game plan for something very different, something that you can use schematically take advantage of angles and, and you don't have to block guys head on. And then it becomes a recruiting emphasis, right? And you're able to look for players. Other people really couldn't do anything with. So where maybe um, for a UConn, you know, they do have a benefit of being up there by themselves in a lot of ways. Right. So they're sort of in a vein of Hawaii. Um, you know, when you look now at Boise, they're alone. 
you know, because Idaho dropped down, fell back down. Um, you know, when you're alone in a state, Nebraska, you can take advantage of that through a variety of ways. One is that you are the lone person recruiting your state. Um, you are the, you know, the showcase program. But two, you can go around and teach your scheme to every single high school coaching clinic that comes through your town. Uh, that's what apparently Tom Osborne really did. He brought all the high school coaches in and taught him his offense. And that made sure that when he was watching film, he was seeing from locals exactly what he was going to get later. And so it helps you monopolize the scheme of what's going on there in town and gives you that recruiting edge. But also you're not looking for the same guys. So if I am a UConn and I'm recruiting um, and I'm looking for – uh, an offensive tackle. I'm not having to compete with Syracuse, Boston College. You know, Boston College, obviously known for running game, big linemen. Um, you know, Syracuse in the air raid. Uh, but you're not, you know, competing against some of those teams for like talent. You're looking for different stuff. You can get leaner offensive linemen. You don't need the kid who's 300 pounds or 290 pounds in high school, right? Um, the quarterback situation can be very handpicked and selected. You can find a kid that you think that's the guy that I want. It doesn't have to be competing with everybody else in the country who wants that same five-star quarterback. You can go after different types of players and you're not getting those kids anyway, really, right? You're not really signing, you know, the number one rate recruiting class at UConn or at, um, Hawaii or at, you know, some of these other places like UTEP or something like that, where you, you know, you could say, oh, it's going to hurt recruiting. Well, no, it's not. You weren't recruiting well in the first place. But now it'll make you at least different. It'll be a recruiting advantage for you to go out and, and pick these players up. From a number standpoint, I don't know how much UConn could take advantage of this because uh, even if you look uh, beyond UConn or beyond Connecticut to, to the neighboring states, yeah, if you go west, you've got Syracuse, Boston College, well, north of them, Boston College, Syracuse, Rutgers, et cetera. And there's some football that starts to be played with the Penn State and so forth. But the neighboring states, Rhode Island, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, no FES programs in any of those states. Not a whole lot of kids that play football at that level. Uh, when you mention UTEP, Texas, El Paso, and think about, you know, they're kind of in a wasteland in regards to Texas, but there's so many football players in Texas that they should be able to find some level of talent. And then even in New Mexico and Arizona, uh, they play some decent football. Yeah, and in Arizona... The JUCO system in Arizona, and this is a whole other story, but collapsing really is going to mess with some of the dynamic there. Like I was really thinking that like the UNLVs of the world, now they're getting an indoor facility and they're going to have a new stadium. I really thought that they were about to take advantage. And I think the JUCO system uh, in Arizona basically collapsed and just went away in like a, like a snap of a finger. Um, I really think that that's going to hurt the UNLVs because I thought they were about to kind of skyrocket up with the new stadium and the indoor practice facility, new weight room, new locker room. And then it was like, oh, but a big pipeline that we should be hitting uh, is kind of gone away. But yeah, Arizona high school football is a lot better than people even know. Um, and you look at the bottom of the S&P Plus um, overall, and you're looking at UTEP, Rice, Connecticut, and UTSA were, were the bottom you know, four with them Bowling Green. Well, the thing in common with four of those five are pretty good, if not dominant programs in your state. You know, if I'm having to recruit against Texas A&M, Texas, Oklahoma cherry picking, North Texas is improving, all these different programs, I can't do it by going at the exact same method. You know, I, I thought personally Rice would benefit from being a flex bone team. So now you're the West Coast version of it. UConn can be the Northeastern version of all the obviously West Points up there, but it's a different kit. You know, not everyone can go to West Point, obviously, for an obvious reason. And what they, you know, leave there and become is the – reason why they're you know it all it all makes sense a lot of fortune 500 ceos come out of west point for a reason so it's a different person but you can still get a high achieving you know hard-ass kid that'll play football for you georgia state georgia state sorry buddy there's a lot of recruiting hands digging into that pile that have been there forever you know they're in the bottom 10 of the s p plus to go out and run the ncaa offense just doesn't make any sense to me if you're on an island out all by yourself, be something different. Hawaii for a long time was run and shoot. It was very different. They're throwing for 5,000 yards for anybody who even knew what that was. Um, you know, back with, you know, and BYU was doing as well, obviously. But, you know, in this era where everyone wants to run the same offense, just about being contrary and doing something different would really help those guys in recruiting because they'd be going after a different type of kid. It would help them schematically. It would help them because other people are practicing for things that are different. And it seems to work for, particular people that are very committed to 
doing it. So the minute that you 100% wholesale commit, it obviously is successful. And it worked in the ACC, whether people want to admit it or not. You know, Georgia Tech had a couple of four and eight years. They also went to the ACC championship a couple of times. They blew out Miami once. They beat up on Florida State once. I mean, you know, they – they, and they, they competed with people they otherwise shouldn't have considering the academic requirements at that school. Yeah, they generally went seven and five and eight and four, those kind of records for most of Paul Johnson's tenure there. They finished ranked a number of times. They were they were more than competitive. They were more than marginal. Certainly, they were recruiting in the 60s and 70s and basically playing football on the average year in more like the 30 to 35th best team in the country range. And so that they were outplaying their recruiting rankings. Uh, you bring up the military academies, and this is a discussion maybe for another week. That fascinates me that Navy, Army, Air Force, and certainly Army's the best of the bunch right now. Navy has been for 15 or 20 years. Air Force was at different times in the 80s and 90s. How those schools in particular, as group of five, and with this whole different pool of players and student athletes that have so many more and different responsibilities where football's on the back burner to a certain extent. Obviously, they're playing in an extremely high level, but the football is not the focus. And to be able to compete, uh, not just at the group of five level, and those schools consistently at different times win eight, nine games, go to decent bowl games, play with power five teams, play them well, and with no NFL players on the roster. And, and that just fascinates me. Yeah, you might have one NFL player, uh, you know, um, trying to get a big tackle with the Steelers that played sort of tight end receiver at Army, uh, Villanueva, right, I think is his last yeah. name. He, he, you know, he was at West Point. Um, you know, Kyle Eckel hung around the NFL for a little while, right? Um, you know, with the Patriots. If I've, got, if I've got the names mixed up, maybe not. Uh, yeah. Know, uh, the Cowboys had a tackle about 20 years ago, Chad Hennings, who played at Air Force. Navy had a running back, uh, Napoleon McCallum, who played with the Raiders. There, there haven't been that many. <laughs> Just because they made a different commitment. Yeah, you're Absolutely. looking at it dozen. Yeah. And, and way back, way back. The classic of all time is Roger Staubach, one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the NFL. Didn't step on an NFL field till he was 29 years old. Can you imagine that guy, a guy that good, and uh, he had a, like a five-year commitment, and then he steps on the field at 29 and uh, has a legendary career and goes to five Super Bowls. But uh, he made that kind of commitment, and then he can still play at, at that level that much later. Just uh, very strange stuff. Very interesting and intriguing to me. And I used to have. Uh, FPS coaches come on for interviews, and I had a few of the military uh, academy coaches, Troy Calhoun from Air Force in particular, and I, I would just try to pick his brain to figure out how they were able to compete at that level. But obviously, as you as you know and will describe to us uh, maybe in a later version, it's that offense that nobody sees that they have down to a T. It's almost like Vince Lombardi's Packers that would run like five plays, but they had them executed so well that uh, people knew they were coming and they couldn't stop it. Yeah, Mike Leach doesn't run a whole lot of plays either, but he's going to score 40 points, right? Like it's, you know, the only person who seems to have him figured out is Chris Peterson. Um, when you're looking at it, yeah, it, it is the execution, right? It's clarity, confidence, and conviction. It's something I say in every job interview I have. It's something I tell every person that's stuck in an office with me or something like that. If you have clarity, you understand exactly what the rules are, and what you're going for, your approach, right? What, how, why? You know, Simon Sinek would call it what, how, why. If you have that clarity, then you have the confidence to go out and do it. Well, we ran the same five plays a thousand times. You should be good at them by now, right? And then the conviction. Now you're going to go out and do it. Well, there's nobody with more conviction than kids at a service academy. It's just you're not going to find it. So you're looking at grit and you're trying to judge grit. Well, the guys who make it for naps or, you know, and they make it up into freshman year and stuff, you know, they don't usually play at Navy, especially. I'm, I've been following Navy a lot more for a lot longer of a time. They don't usually play at Navy till you're a junior or senior. You know, the first couple of years, you kind of, struggling to get by a lot of guys go to the naval prep school naps and you know they they kind of struggle through that process and then sort of emerge and really get playing time as a senior you know to play as a junior and a senior is even kind of rare a lot of guys just play as seniors so you by that point clarity comments conviction you've also shown the grit to survive being at the service academies for three four five years worth of that you know type of training and rigor um, and I think at that point you're ready to win, you know, like you don't want to be there and, and win two or three games. 
and you're not going to because you're not going to allow yourself to do it. I think that's the edge that they have as well um, is a maturity and a grit edge that you're not going to get from a lot of other people where guys are sort of in the AAU basketball mold of, well, me, me, me. Well, they're being told every day and everything else they do, there is no me, me, me. And so that whole me attitude is sort of pushed away. The guys who aren't going to make it are already long gone. You know, because after the second year, you can kind of determine whether you're going to stay or not and, and you know, kind of get out of it in a sense. And then from then on, you're own. You know, it's, it's, you're there. But by that point, you know, you're ready to do it. You know, you're 100% bought in. So I think that's how they do it. It is clarity, confidence, conviction. It's understanding the what, uh, what, how, and why. And then it's going out and executing. And I, I think you can't argue with the grit of somebody in a service academy. Um, and it's a re- and they're not intimidated, right? You're, you're not, you're not blown away that Oklahoma's coming in and you're having to play West Point, you know, and you're West Point, you're going over home. You're not, that doesn't phase you. You're doing a lot more important things than playing that football game on a daily basis. So I think it, it, it definitely benefits even more so the service academies than a UTEP or a Rice. But, you know, Rice is a high academic standard. When you look at Stanford, they've been recruiting nationally for everything for so long. You know that Stanford name. You know where it is. Um, you had Bill Walsh. You know, you understand, you know, now at this point, Harbaugh and Sean, these guys are all, you know, Denny Green, these guys are all like household names that have been coaches there, right? I think at a Rice, you don't have that. They've been bad forever. I don't recall a good Rice season at the top of my head. I've been following this crap since I was like eight years old. So I think what you would do there is it may not be as beneficial right away, but you're not going to be able to run Stanford's offense. You're not going to go out and recruit a top 25 class, obviously, right? Even though Stanford has all those requirements, they still manage to have a top-rated class. I think what they have to do at a Rice, is, because it's a high academic school, is focus on being sort of, you know, a Georgia Tech, what Georgia Tech just did. Sure, we're going to recruit in the 60s and 70s, but we're going to run this offense, and it's going to be very successful for us. Look at Ohio. Frank Solich went from, you know, the Nebraska offense, you know, a little wing back and a, and a tight end and running a triple option, and he's just slowly – adapted that into being a 9-10 win 40 points a game guy. I mean, you thought, you thought ball control, you thought Frank Solich. I mean, he just looks like a ball control coach from 1965. But now look at him. It's one of the most, you know, exciting offenses to watch. They put on some of the best bowl games you're going to see. There you go, Randy. That's all. You've got your blueprint. You've got about two weeks to execute it. Yeah. You know, uh, if you can struggle through this year, then maybe you overhaul the whole thing, or it's probably going to have to be a new guy that comes in, and maybe you go into the transfer portal, you make a deal with Georgia Tech, and you just trade a lot of players <laughs> is what you do, something like that. Uh, all kidding, of course. All right, Justin Dottavio teaching us something each and every week. Uh, you can catch him at Iron Man Football, also State of the U, where he breaks down game film. It's really good stuff. Justin, appreciate you stopping by. No problem, thank you.